All right, we've got a bunch of people joining us live now, so I will uh, fade this out. And welcome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming to join us today. Thanks for having me. So um, I'm going to do a little introduction of, of us. I'm going to do a little introduction of you. I know that uh, you know, a lot of our um, followers uh, on social may not be familiar with you and what you do, and I'm sure that a lot of yours have never heard about Epilog before. So uh, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the co-founders of Epilog. And um, what we do is we help people uh, complete their own basic estate planning what that means is that you know, there's so many Canadians, over 10 million, that don't have any estate planning in place. And that basically means a will, a last will and testament, and powers of attorney, documents that help you in case you become incapable, let somebody else make decisions for you. And uh, my co-founder, Daniel, and I uh, are both former estate planning lawyers, and we recognize this as a huge issue. So we started uh, Epilogue as a technology company that actually allows people to create these documents, basic wills and powers of attorney for themselves without having to go to a, a lawyer, uh, without having to spend a lot of time or money. You can do it from the comfort of your own home, completely an online uh, process to make sure that as many people can get these documents as possible. One of the things that we started doing uh, more recently is we started doing these Instagram lives, which is a um, a segment that we call uh, Coffee with an Estate Lawyer. And uh, we do it every few weeks. And we tackle another uh, issue or another problem or another question in the world of estate planning or uh, financial planning, things that you know people don't necessarily know a lot about. Um, people, they, the things that people are, you know, sometimes unsure where to get information or unsure who to ask. And so uh, through this uh, um, coffee with an estate lawyer program. We're trying to get some of that information out, and every time we do, and we have a, a another sort of specialist that we reach out to who helps us, um, uh, you know, talk about some of these important topics. So today, uh, we're talking with Neil Winokur, um, and so first and foremost, Neil is an accountant, and he's going to help us out today because today we are going to be talking about death and taxes, and what happens when somebody passes away and uh, what the taxes what taxes are involved with that so first and foremost Neil is an accountant he's an expert in this stuff and he's been doing this for um, over seven years as an accountant and uh, he's got a lot of great experience but I would also be remiss if I didn't also mention that Neil is an author so he's got his book back there I'm going to show you the close-up I don't know if on my screen, it comes up backwards. You, can you see it the right way, Neil? It's backwards, but it's okay. Okay, so if you can, it, I'll, it's, it's called the grumpy. It, it, it's backwards, just like our entire tax system is backwards. Okay, so yeah. that's a good segue into the, the, so the grumpy accountant. So Neil is, although he's a really nice guy, he is a grumpy accountant. Um, Neil wrote this book um, to help highlight uh, what in his mind is a huge problem with our tax system, which is basically how complicated it is and how convoluted it is and how we have, we've got, you know, hundreds of different forms and it, nobody, you know, it's very hard for somebody without any knowledge of this system to sit down and be able to do their own taxes. And there's programs that exist that help us with these things, but there are so many uh, nooks and crannies and intricacies and and neil points out a lot of them in his uh in his book uh and another uh, really great thing that he does is um he actually helps people out like he doesn't just tell people the problems like he he's come up with some solutions he could talk a little bit about those um but he also gives people um you know some some helpful tips and then the last thing i'll mention before i give neil a chance to sort of tell us a little bit more about himself is he is a co-founder of a company as well uh this is uh, relatively new but um if anybody is watching or if you know anybody who is a real estate agent neil's uh, accounting practice is now laser focused on helping um, real estate, realtors, real estate agents um, with their taxes and whether they're sole proprietors or whether they have, um, uh, you know, a, a new 
uh, Real Estate Professional Corporation, which is a new thing uh, that, that people can only do recently. Neil's working on that. So, Neil, why don't you, you know, introduce us a little bit more to yourself and tell us about what you do and, and where you're coming from. Yeah, sure. Well, like you said, I'm an accountant. I'm a grumpy accountant because once you really know how our tax system works and you see how ridiculously complicated it is, um, how could you not be grumpy? And it always amazes me when I talk to other accountants who like actually enjoy this and, and, and they'll say, yeah, our tax system is great. It makes sense. It's fine. I'm like, what? And it just blows my mind that people can think there's nothing wrong with our tax system. So I'm very outspoken about it. And that's what my book is about, The Grumpy Accountant, about how complicated it is, my ideas on how to simplify it. And also, um, you know, like you said, there's tax tips in the book as well. So I'm very outspoken about how complicated our system is. I, my dream, like this is literally my dream, and it's what I think about. The, the last thing I think about before I fall asleep at night is like, why do I have a job filing tax returns there should be no no such job should exist people should be able to um really file on their own or most people actually not even have to file a tax return at all which sounds so radical and foreign to us as canadians but actually in many other countries in the world that is how the system works they call it a no filing tax system so i could go on for hours about that issue <laughs> um but i know that's not the topic for today but we can talk about that um and yeah, and I, I recently co-founded a new accounting firm called RealtyTax.ca, which spe specializes in uh, real estate agents, realtors, helping them incorporate their new their corporations, which they're allowed to incorporate now. And whether they're incorporated or not, we service uh, real estate agents here in Ontario. So, you know, what, what I'm hearing from you and sort of where I think there's like a lot of uh, sort of... Uh, convergence of our opinions and point of view and stuff like that is that you know whether it's estate planning or whether it's taxes things are complicated and it means that things get expensive and it means that people shy away from doing it mm -hmm. and uh you know they're not sure how to approach it and so they rely on professionals and i think in, in both cases we're saying like it doesn't have to be that way we can make things more affordable more accessible and uh and you know just a, a simpler more approachable system for people yeah exactly um, okay, so one thing before we dive into the taxes, one thing I'll ask you about. I asked you if you had, because we call this coffee with an estate lawyer, Daniel and I, when we were doing these together, we would often compare mugs. And so I asked you if you had any interesting mugs to bring today. Okay, so I don't know if you could see. How do I? This is my Seinfeld mug. This is my favorite mug that my wife got me one year for, I don't know, our anniversary or Father's Day or whatever it was. So I don't know if you could see it. It has every catchphrase. It has these pretzels are making me thirsty. She had man hands. Look to the cookie. Are you still master of your domain? You're killing a dependent George. You're an anti-dentite. He's a mimbo. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And, you know, and so forth. All right. So that's, and uh, Neil's a big Seinfeld fan. Uh, if you are a Seinfeld fan and you're interested in, in his book, there's a lot of Easter eggs in there. Like the whole, there's just a lot of references to uh, Seinfeld. I see you have uh, the Kramer in your, in your background. Um, and I, brought my city of toronto recycling bin mug with complete with <laughs> raccoon sticking out of it this was oh one that i God. got wow. uh, just before the holidays okay so let's dive into it um there's an expression it says that there are only two certainties in life death and taxes right and so that's what we're going to talk about today so you've got you've got about 20 chapters of your book devoted to all the way that the tax the tax system in Canada touches our lives while we're while we're living, right? So whether that's payroll taxes because you you're you're an employee somewhere and you're getting money deducted off your salary for taxes, or whether it's savings through like an RRSP or a TFSA, these are all the things that happen throughout somebody's life. And you're you you know as you describe in your books, there's a there's a heavy tax burden on the Canadian public. So it must be the case that like. Once you're dead, there's no more taxes to worry about. That's the way to get out of paying taxes. I must be correct there. Obviously, you're not correct. Uh, it never ends, okay? So when somebody dies, you would th like, like you said, you would think it's over, but it's not. You're taxed beyond the grave. So first of all, on the date of death, um, what happens is the taxpayer, who's now dead, so obviously he or she can't actually do this, but the taxpayer has to file what's called the final tax return, or they call it the terminal return. So 
this is the final tax return, which is basically from January 1st until the date of death. And in that final tax return, which is filed by the, you know, the executor of the estate, somebody has to file it. Um, and it's pretty complicated how to actually get that done. It's not as simple as people think. Um, there could be a very big tax bill in that final tax return um, for a number of reasons. So that, that's one aspect of it is the final tax return. And then if there's still income being earned after the date of death, then the, that becomes what's called the estate and all assets go into the estate and then the estate has to file a tax return every year to report any income. And that we report on what's called a T3, a trust return. So you could have in theory, a person dies in let's say the year 2021 and for the next 20 years, the estate is still filing a tax return. So because there's still income being earned. Um, so like even let's say if you don't believe in the afterlife, well, this is the afterlife. What if, if not, like what, what is the afterlife? If not this estate T3, your name lives on through this estate trust tax return has to be filed every year. So, so one of the questions that people ask me a lot, I mean, I practice in this area as an estate planning lawyer and as a tax lawyer, you know, one of the basic questions is like, you know, is there an inheritance tax? Is that what you're talking about when you say somebody dies and there's tax? Is that an inheritance tax that we have? Okay. So inheritance tax would mean the person inheriting the money from the person who died would have to pay a tax on that inheritance. I just see in the, in the questions, someone just wrote, is there a death tax in Canada? So it depends how you define death tax. So a lot of people think we don't have a death tax, um, but the way it works is like this. If you inherit money, let's say you have a relative who died and you inherit the money, you do not have to pay tax on the money that you inherit. So in that respect, there's no inheritance tax in Canada. However, the person who died has to pay a big tax bill on the date of death because what happens is it's called a deemed disposition, which means disposition means like a sale. All the assets that the dead person owned on the date of death are considered deemed by the government to have been sold. Now, they haven't actually been sold in reality, but in, in, in the wonderful, magical world of tax land, this theoretical, nonsensical, irrational kind of system of law, they are considered deemed to have been sold. So what happens is whatever you own, whatever assets you own, now there's some exceptions and exemptions and it gets a little complicated, but basically you might have to report in that final tax return a big capital gain. Um, and so half of the value of the assets would be tax-free, but half of it would be included in income resulting in a big tax bill. Now, once that tax bill is paid and the estate is settled, then the money can be passed on to whoever inherits the money. And at that level, there's no taxation because the tax was paid in that final tax return. So, so let's just, um, let's talk about this deemed disposition for a second. Maybe just an example to help tease it out for people a little bit. So I buy shares in a company. Let's say I buy shares in Bell for $100 when I'm 30 years old. And I hold those shares. I don't sell them. I hold them for my entire life. And then I yeah. pass away when I'm 90 years old. Mm -hmm. And the value of those shares has gone up. Yeah. Right? So when I pass away, the, the Canadian government treats it as if I sold those shares the day I died. Exactly. Whether I actually sold them or not is irrelevant. Right. But they treat it as if I sold those shares. And if yes. I bought them for $100 and then when I pass away, they're worth $5,000. Right. then there's a gain there. The government says you've made money. Yes. And they're going to tax me on that, on that gain. Exactly. So that capital gain, if you bought it for $100, and now they're worth, did you say $5,000? Yeah, I just picked a number. Yeah, it's very ambitious. So, so that gain, <laughs> $4,900 per share, that's a capital gain. So half of that is tax-free, but the other half gets included in the income in that final tax return, resulting in a capital gains tax to be paid in that final return. Um, so some, a lot of people, the problem that they run into is a cash flow problem because remember the shares actually have not actually been sold. So there's no 
cash to sitting around to pay that tax. So it's something that you have to, people have to plan for. Um, so I would actually prefer if they abolish the deemed disposition of death and then put in the inheritance tax instead. I mean, I mean, I'd be happier if they just abolished the tax entirely, but I understand, <laughs> I, I understand the theory behind the, the, behind the tax, right? Because it, I mean, but I'd rather for cash flow purposes, it'd be easier to have the inheritance tax. Someone inherits a bunch of cash, they can, it's like it came, the money came in, they could pay the right. tax. Now, if they inherit the shares and they haven't sold the shares, then you have the same problem. So it's a, it's, it's a weird kind of tax because it's basically, a, a, it, you're taxing an unrealized gain. You haven't sold the shares, so, how, so there's no realized income. So it's a difficult thing. So when people do estate planning, they have to plan for this. You have to look at whether, you have to look at your assets. What assets do you own? Um, now, the principal residence would be exempt from this. The value of your house would be, right, that you live in. But if you own a family cottage, right, and you own a house in the city or something, well, one of those you're going to have to pay tax on, right? So people have to plan for this um, when they do estate planning, like come up with a list of everything you own. And, you know, the TFSA, the RRSP might be exempt. Oh, no, no, not RRSP, actually, sorry. But the TFSA might be exempt and there's other exemptions. But you have to come up with a list of assets that you own and try and plan, okay, what would the capital gain be? And come up with an estimate of what the tax would be and then somehow plan for that by life insurance to cover it. You, you know, there's things you can do. Yeah, yeah, we had a, actually, I think it was the last coffee with an estate lawyer uh, that, that Daniel did with, uh, with um, an insurance professional who was talking about this very thing, you know, the thing, the reasons you buy life insurance and certainly tax covering this tax liability is one of them. You mentioned RRSPs, right? Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, a lot of people are encouraged to save in an RRSP. And so, and that's tax free, right? In fact, it's, it's really good because like if I'm contributing to my RRSP, it's actually reducing the tax that I pay on a year by year basis. Right. So that money's sitting in my RRSP, it's accumulating, yep. uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's growing and it's growing tax free. Right. So what happens to that when somebody passes away? Yeah, so RSPs, a lot of Canadians aren't contributing to their RSP because they think, well, I'm going to have to pay tax later on, so what's the point? But it, um, Jamie Golombic, he's a commentator in the Financial Post. He's one of the top tax guys in the country. He works at CIBC Wealth Management. And he actually ran the numbers. He did this, he released an ebook recently about RSPs. For people who own small businesses and just regular employed Canadians, the RSP is still very beneficial. I always recommend people contribute if they're able to. And same thing with TFSA, max value TFSA, it's a no brainer. Um, but the RSP, even though you'll pay tax later on, it's still worth it because you pay less tax each year you contribute. And then once the money's in there, it grows tax free and you can reinvest it. So all that tax free compounding really adds up. Now, the downside is, when you, after you turn 71 years old, the money starts coming out of your RRSP at fixed rates and, there, and it goes into your income and you pay tax. But it's still worth it because if, if you start investing when you're, let's say, 25 years old and you have until you're 71 years old, that's whatever, almost 50 years of tax-free compounding within the account. Um, so it's very beneficial. But, but on the date of death, if you still have money in there, and usually it's called a RIF, R-R-I-F at that point. The RSP converts into this thing called a RIF. Um, but on the date of death, the full va value of whatever is left in there gets included in your income, in your final tax return. And a lot of people don't realize that and they don't plan for that big tax bill. So that's something um, that people have to keep in mind that when you do the estimate of what tax you might owe on the date of death, you have to look at what will the value of your art of your riff be at the date of death because that gets included in your income. So what some people do to plan for this is they'll withdraw money from the riff each year if they're still in the lower tax bracket. Um, each year while they're still alive, they'll take out money from the riff and that to try and bring it down as much as possible by the date of death while staying in a low tax bracket each year. So it's this game we kind of play, and I talk about this in my book. If we had a simpler tax system, we've made it too complicated. RRSPs, TFSA, CPP, old age security. There's so many complicated factors here. Um, I think we've overdone it, and we need, if we could simplify the whole thing, I think that would help a lot of people in this type of planning. 
Yeah, I think I, I, it's a really good point. And I think that touches on, I, I mean, I saw that we've had a number of questions come in. And I think what you just said touches on a bunch of them. Right? Somebody asks, the system is so convoluted, why hasn't it been streamlined? Who's in wow. charge? This, you know, we got another question. I think you just sort of, uh, you know, addressed it about uh, how RRSPs reduce your taxes now. Yeah. But somebody else says, "What should I do? Should I contribute to a TFSA? Should I contribute to an RRSP?" And this all goes to the point you just made: is that there's there's all these options out there. People aren't sure what these different vehicles yeah. are. Okay, so the first question: why why is it so complicated? Who's in charge? The blame for this, for the complicated tax system, is not the CRA. It's not their fault. The CRA is just doing their job. So the fault is the Minister of Finance, who runs the Department of Finance, and the Prime Minister, because they're in charge of the legislative agenda. So if you want change and simplification, the pressure has to go onto the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister. And in my book, I specifically say this, and I blame the blame lies with every single prime minister, minister of finance since 1971, because the last, um, the last time we had comprehensive tax reform in Canada was in the late 1960s, 1967, they released what was called the Carter Commission. And the Carter Commission, they did a five-year comprehensive study on the entire tax system. They did a whole review and they, and they changed a lot of things. We, since, since 1971, we have not done a comprehensive full review of our tax system. Look how the world has changed in the past 50 years. E-commerce and, and doing business over all different jurisdictions. We haven't updated our tax system over 50 years. So the blame is the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister. You should buy my book and send it to them and send it to your member of parliament as well. Um, the, the other question is how does RRSP save money now? When you contribute to your RRSP, every dollar you contribute, is a, you can deduct off your income on your tax return. So you're lowering your income now, and therefore that lowers your tax bill. That's why people get a tax refund if they contribute to your RSP. So that's how you, that's why the RSP is beneficial right now. So for example, let's say your salary is $100,000 a year, and your marginal tax rate, let's say is 35%. If you put in $10,000 into your RSP, just as an example, you'll get a $3,500 tax refund right now. Then you could take that money and save it or put, you know, put in your TFSA, put in your kids' RESP, buy a few big screen TVs. I don't know. You can do whatever you want. But the fact is you have more money right now. Um, and the other question was, what's better, RESP or TFSA? So the way I would answer that is, if you're in a high income bracket and you can afford to do both, then do both. They're both beneficial in different ways. So if you can afford to do both, you do both. If you're in the lower bracket and you can really only afford one each year, some people still say the RRSP is actually better, um, and some people would say the TFSA is better. So for that, you need to get like more specialized advice for like because it really depends on your specific situation. The TFSA is a lot more flexible. If you need the money, you can take it out from your TFSA and you don't pay tax. But if you don't need the money for a long period of time, you could leave it in the RSP. Maybe that's better. So it it depends on on the specific situation. Yeah, and I mean, one of the important things, you know, just sort of talking about how these things are great tools during our lifetime, but specifically in the case of the RRSP or the RIF, if you're over the age of 71, what happens on death? It's something that I think a lot of people don't appreciate, right? When, when people are older and they're thinking about how much they have to pass on to the next generation, right. they might look at their RIF and say, oh, I've got, you know, $500,000 in my mm. RIF, and that's going to be a really great inheritance yeah. for, my, for my kids, Without realizing that, you know, that riff, uh, when, you're, when you pass away, I often say, like, you know, the biggest tax bill that anybody ever gets in their entire life is the tax bill they get right after they die. Right. Because that's when you have this deemed disposition. Or like you said with the RR, uh, the, the RIF or the RRSP, that's when, you know, if you have a 500,000 RRSP, um, on your final tax return, that's included in your income. It's as if you made five hundred thousand dollars in yeah. that one year, right. and that that gets it goes into the calculation of yeah. um, of the taxes. Yeah. And so that that five hundred thousand dollars isn't there for your family. Right. A big chunk of it has to go to uh, to yeah. pay tax. Yeah, yeah. What they really should do is they should take this is sort of more complicated, but it's more fair. See, the problem with the tax system is if you want it to be very fair it's going to be very complicated. 
if you want it to be very simple, like let's say a flat tax, well, maybe that's not as fair. So that's always the trade-off with tax policy is, is your, it's a constant battle and war between like simplicity versus fairness. People want it to be so perfectly fair that it becomes so insanely complicated. So what I say is like the Canadian tax system right now leans completely towards fairness, but we've sacrificed simplicity. And right. in a certain way, it's actually not fair because if you really want to take advantage of the tax system, you need to be able to afford the best tax advisors. And that's unfair because most people can't afford it. So we think it's fair, but really, in a way, it's not. Um, but with the tax bill on death, like with the RSPs, let's say you have a $500,000 value in your RIF on the date of death. If 500000 is included in your income, your tax bill is $250,000. So that's a, that's a big problem. See what I think they should do. Take an, what's the average tax rate you paid throughout your entire life? And that should be the tax rate applied on, on the date of death in your final tax return, right? It's not, if you never pay the 50% right. tax rate every year you were alive, why should you have to pay it in the last year just because the value, right? So there's a, there's a bit of a, but the, the other side of the argument would be, well, no, remember you got a tax refund every year you contributed to your RSP, so now yep. we're just taking it back. So um, it, it's all like, it's, it's complicated. It's not as simple as I make it out to be, but um, the point is people have to plan for this date of death, uh, big tax bill. Just to give uh, just to give everyone an idea, this is this is Neil's book. It's a very easy read. The, the Income Tax Act. How many of these would I have to stack up to get to the size of our Income Tax Act? The Income Tax um, Act is three thousand pages long. My book is less than two hundred pages. My book reads as a novel. I stole the idea from the wealthy barber. I have to spoke, <laughs> no. Well, I spoke to David Chilton, the author of the Wealthy Barber. I told him I want to write a book, The Grumpy Accountant. And I, I want to write it as a story. So my book is about Jerry and George and Elaine. And they go through the tax system. George is the grumpy accountant. And David Chilton told me, yes, go. I asked for his permission. And he said, yes, you can. It's a great idea. Go for it. Um, but yeah, the Income Tax Act is over 3,000 pages. It has 1 million, over 1 million words. Okay. Nobody can understand it. Nobody really reads it, honestly. Um, and it's funny because when the income tax first came to Canada, it was 1917. It was supposed to be a temporary measure to help fund the cost of World War I. Remember, World War I was 1914 to 1918. So in 1917, the government, like running out of money, there's all these debts from the war, and they put in what was called the Income War Measures Act. It was, it was just for the, to fight the war. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to end when the war ended. Um, and of course, it's over 100 years later, we still have it. But when, in when the Income War Measures Act first was established, the legislation was only 20, no, it was 11 pages long, 11 pages, you could read it in 20 minutes. And it only forced the top 2%. You know how Bernie Sanders, the top 1% and the Income War <laughs> Measures Act was only the top 2% of income earners had to file a tax return and pay income tax. The bottom 98% did not have to file a tax return and did not have to pay any tax. Today, as soon as you earn $14,000 of income, you have to pay tax. And even if you earn zero income, you have to file a tax return. If you want to receive GST credits, Canada Child Benefits, even if you have no income, you must file a tax return. You won't receive any benefits without filing return. So the system has become insanely complicated where we force literally like 28, there's 28 million people every year in Canada that are filing a tax return. That is insane. So what I show in my book is a way to simplify the system that could be revenue neutral to the government. We don't have to abolish taxation. We could have the same amount of tax collected, but in a much simpler way where we free people from the burden of filing. Okay, so I'm going to ask, so um, going back to the topic of the death and taxes, right? Because there's yes. one other tax that somebody asked about in the questions that I want to get to, and it is uh, called the probate tax. Daniel and I have talked about probate, and it's one of these words that people hear, mm -hmm. right? I need to probate a will. Yes. But nobody really knows what that means. And so <laughs> we've, we've, we've talked about, uh, Daniel and I have talked about, if uh, people have watched other, other uh, you know, Coffee with an Estate Lawyer episodes, that probating a will means proving the will. It means going to the court and getting like literally the court seal on the will saying, this is the last will. Mm -hmm. But like many other things, 
around you know death there's a tax associated with that too right could you speak to that a little bit yeah so it varies by province this is a provincial thing so some provinces have just a flat fee where they charge you a hundred dollars and that's it and they'll stamp the will but ontario in ontario we have um i'm just looking at it now there's a cost it's five dollars per every thousand dollars for the first fifty thousand of your estate of the value of the estate and above fifty thousand, you pay fifteen dollars for every thousand dollars. So it could really add up. And they include in here. So basically, it's an asset tax. It's a tax on the value of your assets. So you add up all the assets, um, and then you you calculate the value, and then that's how they calculate the the tax that you owe. And they include in this. This is where people get hit, and you don't realize your principal residence, the value of your house on the date of death. Um, would be included. So a lot of people get hit with that because, uh, as we know, especially in the GTA, uh, Vancouver as well, like the real estate market has really gone up in the past, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, right? So um, this could be a big burden on families as well that people don't plan for and might not have the cash flow either because it's not an income tax. It's not based on income. It's based on assets, the value of the, of the asset. Yeah, I mean, this is this is one that I mean, practicing as a, an estate planning lawyer, probate probate tax is something we always uh, tried to address when we were helping people do their planning, and it really is um, this. Uh, somebody asking asking a question: When is it required to probate a will? So, so there's no law that says you have to probate a will. So, when when uh, somebody's named as the executor uh, in a will they get their authority from the will itself. So they, they, can, they have authority over the estate. The problem is, is that if I'm named as an executor in a will and somebody passes away and I have their will and I go to the bank and I say, okay, well, give me access to their accounts um, because I need to administer the estate, the bank's going to say no because we don't know who you are. You're coming in with this thing that you're saying is the will of this person who's deceased. Yeah, you have a death certificate, but we're not willing to take on that liability to, you know, just give you access to the accounts. So it's really, you know, banks or like the land registry, it's third parties that say we need to see a probated will. We need to see a will that's gone through the court that has this official stamp on it before we give you access to these accounts. And that's why somebody would have to go out and get a will probated. But like you said, Neil, in some jurisdictions in some provinces, they charge a flat fee for that. They say, okay, our fee for probate is $100 and we'll give you that stamp. Right. In Ontario, even though the process is exactly the same, that it comes before a judge with an application mm -hmm. and you know they approve it with, with this seal, even though the, the process is the same, whether the estate is worth $100,000 or $100 million, right. Um, the fee that they charge mm -hmm. is based on the actual assets and the estate. And we won't, we won't get into it now. I mean, I think this is a good topic for a future one of these discussions. But there's a lot of uh, ways that people can plan around that. Right. Um, you know, uh, just to go back to one of the things we talked about today, an RRSP. An RRSP does not count for that calculation mm -hmm. if you've – done certain things. If you right. sort of check the right boxes and filled out the right forms, that's right. a way around it. And so, I mean, this is probably a, a whole other half right. hour talk about, uh, you know, probate planning and taxes. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it sounds like, and just to sort of, you know, put a bow on things a little bit, you know, it seems like, you know, in the death and taxes world, there are kind of three major things that people need to be aware of. The first is that when you pass away, there's this, you know, deemed disposition and your RRSP seem to be included. So there, even though we don't have an inheritance tax on the people mm -hmm. that are getting the assets, mm -hmm. there's a tax that where the person who died, their estate, their, their, uh, they, they basically get a big tax bill at the end of the day that they have to pay. Right. And, you know, if, if, if I own shares of Bell, that's okay, they can be sold. But if my assets are because I own a building, um, that's a lot harder to sell in order to satisfy those taxes and my family mm -hmm. might not want to. So that's the first one is this, right. this, this tax that happens because of death. Then you also mentioned these T3 returns that could happen for years and years and years after somebody else pass, after somebody passes away mm -hmm. where their estate is going on. Maybe the kids are young and they have, the funds have to be kept in the estate in trust for them. 
for many right. years to be to, for many years to come, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that's an annual tax filing that could right. go on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is this probate, which is another tax that people have to be aware of that, especially if you're in a jurisdiction like Ontario, you have to be mindful of what your assets are because there's going to be a, a tax to pay at the end. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, All right. it's not simple. Yeah. Are there more questions? I saw people I'm just, asking. I'm looking now, I'm looking to see if there's questions. So yeah, I mean, somebody, I think, uh, you know, a, a question that we had questions about RSPs and probate and somebody said, and they're absolutely right, that deemed disposition can be problematic, which is very true and which is why people have to sort of, sort of f figure out what that's going to be and, and uh, you know, plan for it with insurance and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, but there's lots of resources on our website and I'm going to go back to, to your book, which like you said, it's a lot simpler than the Income Tax Act to read. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, if you've got, uh, if you've got inter interest in this stuff, then, um, you know, definitely the book will talk about RSPs, TFSAs, payroll taxes, charitable donations, um, all these types of things. And, yeah. um, and yeah. it, Neil, it was really great having you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I feel like we could go on for hours if we wanted to. <laughs> We could. We'll make a. Well, you know, listen. If you have anybody who's watching, if you've got questions about this stuff, uh, you can certainly uh, message us or uh, you know message and follow uh, the Grumpy Accountant on Instagram, and yeah. you can ask questions there. Um, and you should, yeah, I'd say, you know, definitely pick up a copy of Neil's book if you want to get some tax tips. Especially yes. now, we're going into tax season. I checked my mail. I had a bunch of T five slips that I'm going to have to, uh, uh, you know, give to the accountant or, or figure out how to enter myself. It's funny, those T5 slips, you know who else already has those T5 slips? The CRA. The CRA. They, they already have that. <laughs> so why do you have to put them in a thing and send it to them? They have your T4, they have your T5s, they have your T3s. They already have it, and we still have to file a tax return. It's so ridiculous. This sounds uh, like a this sounds like a Jerry Seinfeld bit. I think you should write a <laughs> you should you should write do some stand up with some of this stuff. It, it writes itself. Look, the book wrote itself. Seriously, like. It's... <laughs> <laughs> All right, this was great. Um, so uh, again, please uh, you know follow uh, us and and uh, and uh, the Grumpy Accountant on Instagram, and uh, you know you can look at RealtyTax.ca and EpilogueWills.ca um, for uh, you know er updates on the stuff that we're doing. And I want to thank everybody for joining uh, Coffee with an Estate Lawyer today and we're going to have we already have more planned uh, for the future different yeah. topics thanks very much neil <laughs> okay thanks a lot aaron thank you take care bye thanks bye.